the main character of my novel, Kingdom of Women, is uh, a female Roman Catholic priest. And I'm going to give you a little background about the novel before I, I read a few little uh, pieces of scenes from it. Um, so as Mary mentioned, uh, Averill had survived uh, a very traumatic event that actually happened 15 years before the novel opened. Um, she was about to be ordained a priest um, along with uh, 22 other seminarian, women seminarians. And uh, at their ordination ceremony, which is a, a religious ceremony whereby a person becomes a priest um, in the Catholic Church, um, they were all going to be ordained together at uh, a cathedral. And um, a man with a gun who thought that women shouldn't be priests and had no business doing so came and um, opened fire and uh, killed every all the uh, women seminarians uh, except for Averill. She was the only survivor. So that has already happened by the time the novel opens, and she's, she's dealing with that trauma. Um, and uh, part of her story arc in the novel is that she starts to have visions. Um, one of the things uh, she, and she doesn't want to have these visions. This is not something she was planning on doing as being a mystic. Uh, that was not part of the plan. Um, but it, it, the visions start out where she is working at the moment, where she's located at the moment, which is a retreat house that had been a monastery. And so she starts hearing and and seeing the ghosts of the monks who had been in the monastery, and she hears them singing and chanting and so forth. That's one of her first <laughs> experiences where she thinks, hey, something's going on here. Um, and the other thing that's happening in the novel at the same time, sort of around her, is that in the United States and other parts of the world, uh, women are starting to uh, take revenge in different forms. And some of them are forming vigilante groups. Um, and others, other women work solo. And uh, one of the women who does this is another main character in the novel. Her name is Catherine Beck. And her mission, as she calls it, is to um, f track down and kill men who have gotten away with crimes against women. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that a friend of mine who was reading this, she said one of the things that most surprised her about the novel was that these two characters become friends, the, the Roman Catholic priest um, and the assassin. And she, she was saying that she was sort of expecting that these two would come into conflict and that they would oppose each other, maybe even be enemies. And that's not what happens. They have uh, a friendship that lasts to the rest, for the rest of their lives. Um, and so I thought, uh, since we're talking about feminist fiction and so forth, that what I would read are a few uh, pieces of some of the scenes where they are together and interacting with each other. Um, so the first a little piece that I'm going to read is uh, where they're, this is basically their first real conversation. They've, they've kind of met, they've kind of encountered each other before, but this is the first time they're, they're talking, and Averill has told her her name. And so uh, Averill is now sort of watching her reaction, because people still remember this massacre, and they, sometimes they recognize her name, they know who she is, and so forth. So she's watching Catherine's reaction to this, so that's, that's where I'll start. Averill had seen the process before. People would estimate her age, calculate how long she must have been a priest. Then the name, the face, the history of the cathedral massacre clicked into place like abacus beads. After that came the awkward part, the embarrassment, the pity, the politely stifled curiosity. Not so for Catherine. She put the pieces together in a moment, her face never losing its granite calm but her eyes glowed with something like respect, perhaps approval. When we met before, Catherine said, I saw that clerical collar and assumed Unitarian Universalist or Lutheran maybe something more sensible, Averill prompted. <laughs> I was going to say Protestant. She drew up a folding chair near Averill and sat down. No offense, she went on, but I never had much use for religion. The way I see it, life is chemistry. The forming of bonds, the breaking of bonds, between atoms, between molecules, 
That is what keeps life going, from plankton all the way to primates. That's very beautiful, Averill said. Not that there isn't some beauty in religion, Catherine went on. Some poetic stuff, anyway. Like that line about justice and mercy, following you your whole life. Averill looked at her with something like pity in her large, dark eyes. I'm afraid it's goodness and mercy, she said, not justice and mercy. The 23rd Psalm, in the King James translation, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. No justice, Catherine said. Not in that Psalm, anyway. So all these years she'd gotten it wrong. I'll be damned, she said. Probably not. So, so um, the next scene I'm going to read from, um, she, a little later in their friendship, um, not too much later, um, and Catherine has just carried out an, assass an assassination, what she calls her missions, and as she, as she thinks about it, um, she tends to go into an altered state of consciousness when she's carrying out these assassinations and um, she's in a sort of a state of flow and so that's what she's thinking about when she when she goes straight from assassinating someone to to visiting Averill at at the retreat center. The church doors at St. Anthony's were open as if somebody had wanted to air it out. No one was inside. Catherine Beck lingered near the doors looked at the statues and stained glass, went so far as to stand near the back pew. People said they could feel a different energy in a church. In her enhanced state of perception, she reasoned, this would be the time to feel it. She could have driven on to New Falls, found a church there. It was only another 20 minutes. But the woman priest lived here, did whatever it was that Catholic priests did cast spells for all she knew. She told herself she felt nothing and ignored the subsequent sense of relief at this fact. She also ignored faint images that came into her mind at that moment, shreds of a dream perhaps, a fugitive seeking sanctuary in a church, an old woman with, a, with an herb garden telling Catherine to put her bloodied hands into the upturned soil. She walked out of the church and sensed in the breeze something biting and sweet, followed it around behind one of the monastery buildings to where the woman priest knelt barefoot in a garden plot in a blank, black tank top and black canvas work pants with a bushel basket beside her. She seemed not at all startled when she straightened up and saw Catherine standing there. Would you like some help with that, Catherine said. I won't say no. It does get to my lower back after a while, all this squatting. Averill went to the tool shed and came back with a pair of garden gloves and some small tools. What is it we're doing, Catherine said. Pulling weeds. Too bad we can't eat them. We always have a bumper crop. Catherine easily developed a rhythm of loosening the soil at the root of the weed, then pulling and throwing it in the basket. When they took a break, they sat by the potato plants and shared Averill's water bottle. You should put your hands in the soil, Averill said. It'll ground you. Despite Catherine's out outward calm, Averill could feel her jangling nerves, the energy shooting out of her. Come on, I'll do it too. To Catherine, it was new agey and vaguely embarrassing, even though no one else was around and weirdly similar to the dream image she had just recalled. But she followed Averill's lead and dug her hands into the loose garden soil in front of them. If her comrades could see her grounded, they would sneer, like a sulky teenager, like a lightning rod. The soil, moist and warm in her hands, felt so good she had to stop and close her eyes to concentrate on it. She did feel different somehow. Feels good, doesn't it? Averill said. It's why I garden in my bare feet. She looked around at the work left to be done that morning and pointed toward a roll of galvanized steel chicken wire. I'll put that up later, she said, 
once the green beans start germinating. Does it work? Catherine said. The fencing isn't high and it doesn't seem strong. Good enough for the rabbits. It's kind of endearing to watch them. They get to the fence and sniff at it for a minute. They look puzzled, then they hop away. They don't jump over it or dig under it. They don't stay there and rage at it. Such gentle creatures, so reasonable. Imagine if humans were like that. Catherine felt that some kind of response was expected. She thought about humans, about rabbits. It's true, she said, they don't seem to have much of an agenda. Averill smiled. That's exactly it. They're themselves, with no ulterior motive. Sometimes I think I should reward them, you know? Maybe leave a patch of garden unfenced. What do you think? They managed to feed themselves pretty well, even without access to your garden. Two different things, Averill said. What they need and what we can give them. Catherine was beginning to lose the thread of Averill's thoughts. People aren't like rabbits, she said. Or like deer, Averill said. I would also be glad if we were like deer. So then one more little part of a scene. Uh, now this is a little later on in, in part one of the novel and um, we are now at the, at the next anniversary of the Cathedral Massacre, so it's been 16 years at that point. Um, and Averill always observes that day, that anniversary, and she has decided she, she wants to be alone at this point in the day, uh, and she's uh, in the church having a, a solitary vigil, so there's nobody else around her. Um, and here's where there's a reference to the, the ghosts of, of the monks who used to live there, so that's what, what she's uh, referring to um, in, this, in this section. And also by this point in the novel, obviously, uh, Catherine knows about the massacre, and that's, that's what she's referring to when she starts talking to Averill. At the altar, Averill lit 22 taper candles and slipped a glass hurricane lamp cover over each, protecting the fragile, precious flames. Gradually, she became aware of the voices in the choir stall, the monk spirits, praying the litany of the saints in Latin. They moved on to the Requiem Eternum, Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. Maybe it was just as well, thought Averill. Better not to be alone. The Lord will open to them the gate of paradise, chanted the monks, and they will return to that homeland where there is no death, but only lasting joy. Lasting joy, and for the survivor, lasting bitterness. Sitting with eyes closed in front of the retinue of candles, Averill smelled rather than heard the person approaching her. The smell of battlefield dirt and saddle leather and blood. A warrior striding up the aisle, glowing with triumph. She turned. Catherine Beck, poised as ever, stood close enough to notice that Averill smelled of sweat and torment. I wish I'd been there, Catherine said to kill the son of a bitch before he ever had a chance to touch the trigger. Averill saw that the monks had gathered near Catherine and were stirring uncomfortably, dismayed at her anger, perhaps, or her beauty. She drew in her breath, surprised that she was still seeing them when another person was near. Catherine reacted, too, perhaps to Averill's body language. She looked around, slipped her hand into her jacket, are we alone, she said. We're never alone, Averill wanted to say. But she needed to calm Catherine down before she drew a gun in a holy place. There's nothing to worry about, she said. Catherine sat down next to her in the pew, looked at the candles arrayed in front of them. There's another phrase from the Bible I remember, she said. Something about people who hunger and thirst for justice. Or have I misremembered that, too? You haven't misremembered, Averill said. It's in there. And what does the Bible say about them? That they're blessed, that they'll have their fill. Do you believe it? More like wishes, the Beatitudes had always seemed to Averill, 
Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. All kinds of promises to the peacemakers, to the merciful. Catherine thought about her mission that day. Unexpectedly, this one had put up a fight. They'd grappled on the floor like a pair of energetic lovers. She was in too close contact to draw her gun and had to use her knife instead, and then act quickly to leap away in the opposite direction of the blood flow. And then she had come here. <laughs>